here. Great. Uh, well, just to make sure you're on the right event, it's the not-for-profit webinar, the management investment uh, considerations for right now. Uh, so just to make sure you can see the content, uh, we don't have it up just yet, but you, you can see that as long as you can see this slide, make sure you have the, your audio connection. Uh, there also, there's, we're going to be taking, we've reserved a lot of time for questions, so please and use the chat where you use the all panelists, as you can see, and you can send those questions. We'll, we'll go through those at the end and, and uh, try to get to as many as we can. And if you're having any technical issues, uh, please use the chat. And know, too, that we're recording this session, and we'll get the rec recorded uh, WebEx session, the slides, uh, sort of a summary sheet, and then some of the recent articles that we've done and that Bonadio has done on this topic. So we'll, it should be a pretty good information packet that we'll we'll get out to everybody after this as well. So without further ado, Tom, why don't I kick it over? I, I'll send it over to you to kick things off. Okay, great. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Tom Bonadio. I'm the founder of the Bonadio Group. And as many of you know, we have one of the largest not-for-profit practices uh, in the state of New York and even in the United States. Um, and we also have a great partnership with High Probability Advisors. So these are pretty crazy times we're in right now. There's a lot of decisions being made. There's a lot of adjustments uh, to everybody's portfolio and how you run your businesses. So we're going to cover a lot of that today. Uh, on the not-for-profit side, Jeff Paley, my partner Jeff Paley, is going to talk about what's important for your not-for-profits to survive. And then when it comes to your investment strategy, all of our partners from High Probability, Steve, Jeff, and Mike, are going to talk about how you need to look at your portfolios these days. So I'm going to throw it off to Jeff Paley. And Jeff, if you could begin talking about what's necessary for not-for-profits to be thinking about in these, these dire circumstances we're in right now. Thanks very much, Tom. And thanks, everybody, for joining us this afternoon. Um, the, I want to preface this list. We've, we've formatted this part of our discussion in the format of a top 10 list. And this is not a scientific list as much as, as it is a list based on our experience as a firm from serving hundreds of nonprofits um, all over the place. We, I did a sort of an informal poll of our partners and others who serve nonprofits, and these are the top 10 things that came up. So we're going to count them down from number 10 to number one, David Letterman style. We're going to talk specifically about things that are actionable and that are relevant to the current environment we're in. This is not a technical session on PPP forgiveness. We've done a lot of those recently. Maybe some of you have attended those. That's not what we're talking about today. We're talking about more st strategic and actionable items uh, in general for the environment we're in. So if we go to the next slide, we'll start the list on number 10. And I just said we're not going to talk about PPP, but here we are. Look, it's very prevalent. Uh, one of the things we need to do and that we're highly recommending for all of our clients who have got PPP loans is that you document those things that you certified when you applied. There's been a lot of conversation here. Um, it goes back to the Shake Shack case from a few weeks ago uh, where the, there was a lot of bad press for uh, Shake Shack when they took this loan out and they ended up repaying it. Most nonprofits do not have to worry about that kind of exposure. However, there is the possibility that these loans could be reviewed the SBA has indicated that loans over 2 million will be reviewed and I'll put, I'll say that it'll be audited in air quotes because we don't know what audited means in this context. It's important to remember the SBA does not have any people to do audits. They do not have any budget to do audits. We don't know what these audits are gonna be. However, they've said they're gonna do some audits. So documenting these items that you certified when you applied is, is important. Having that contemporaneous documentation so that at some point in the future, if somebody asks questions, um, you don't have to dig that up. You can you have it in your files. So that's number 10. Let's go to number nine. Talk about endowments. Uh, New, in New York State and in many other states, they adopted this Prudent Management of Institutional Funds Act um, over the last 10 to 12 years. Most organizations revised and updated their endowment policies and their investment management policies at that time. But in many cases, because those policies were adopted in the last uh, five to eight years, they have not been tested in a really stressful market environment. So yes, there's been ups and downs in the market over the last five to eight years, but have we had a real stress situation like we had in March of, of 2020? No. So there are organizations who've been talking about modifying their policies and procedures, modifying how they take draws out of their investment portfolio, 
um, and modifying how they manage their portfolio. And you have to understand that under the, under the law, this is not an accounting rule, it's actually law in New York and in, and in most other states. This governs how you manage those portfolios and how you understand uh, your relationship with your endowment activities. You can't necessarily just do what you want with these um, portfolios in a, in a period of market turmoil. So dusting off your policies, making sure that if you're making an exception to the policy, you've documented that appropriately. And also understanding if you wanna change the policy in light of what's going on now, um, some of that or most of it will require a board motion uh, to actually approve those policies. So we are recommending um, uh, caution in this area. Certainly you can make changes to your policy, but make sure you're following the rules uh, in accordance with uh, NIMFA. Number eight, if we talk about the PPP loans and, and understanding what you certified when you uh, took the application, we also have to talk about understanding how you're tracking and, and going to apply for the forgiveness, because that's really the key draw of these loans, is that if you do uh, things in accordance with the program, you can get the loan forgiven after you spend it through the eight-week period. But that, that forgiveness is not guaranteed. You have to make sure that you're following the rules, and the rules are quite complicated. Uh, they are changing on a regular basis. If you're if you're staying in touch with this on Friday night, uh, the SBA issued a huge amount of new guidance, including the template for the forgiveness application, um, and that had a lot of new instructions in it that had not been previously issued before. We've done a lot of educational stuff. We've worked with a lot of clients on this. We really believe it's worthwhile to get help, and I'm not just saying that because we're the ones who are going to offer you the help. It really is beneficial um, to your organization to maximize both the documentation and the strategy around maximizing the forgiveness on these loans. Uh, we have well over 100 organizations already that have, have signed up with us to help with this on a, on a consulting basis. Um, and in every case, at literally 100% of the time, we have found things, ideas, to maximize the forgiveness that the organization had not thought of on their own. There's just too many rules to keep track of. We are keeping track of them because we have um, the breath to do that. And I strongly advise that you get help on this uh, particular endeavor over the next eight or over your eight week period. Let's go to number seven. <clears throat> so this is talking about keeping your eyes open for opportunities. Your, I hope your organization has the financial foundation in terms of liquidity, in terms of uh, reserves, in terms of a line of credit, in terms of taking advantage of some of these um, things like the PPP loan, hopefully you are not worried about surviving through this period and you're going to be able to survive and come out of it on the other end. There are organizations that are not so fortunate um, and, and many times there are organizations struggling financially before all of this happened and this is really just too much for them to handle because they don't have the, the liquidity or the financial wherewithal to get through it. Um, this does not necessarily mean that those organizations are going to go bankrupt and go out of business and you know in a headline grabbing kind of way it could be a lot more subtle than that it could be that as as we come out of this timeout that we've been in an organization comes out of the timeout they open up some of their programs but the other ones don't open and you don't necessarily know this right away but you realize that program is not there now the program that that organization was doing before they can't financially sustain it um, these are opportunities for other nonprofits who are in those kind of programmatic activities to partner with these other organizations, um, to identify opportunities to assume programs from other organizations. And if it's within your mission and you have the financial wherewithal, there could be a lot of opportunities to uh, further your mission by coordinating with some of these other organizations that have had financial challenges through this time that they couldn't um, manage through. So. Um, certainly the financial viability of your programs is a, a concern, but understand that all the other providers in that line of work are also struggling with financial viability and some kind of partnership opportunities could definitely um, benefit your organization and the other organization, as well as the people served by those programs uh, on a go forward basis and those present opportunities in this uh, environment. Let's go to number six. There are other aid programs. Many people are focused on PPP. There are a lot of other things, and this is just a partial, I mean, there's eight things listed here. There's probably 20 things that we've seen organizations taking advantage of. 
whether it be from the CARES Act, whether it be from uh, state level uh, aid programs or other things, there's a lot of things out there and keeping your eyes open for those uh, in terms of what you're eligible for, what they may benefit you, um, in, in what ways they may benefit you uh, is really important. Some of these things are mutually exclusive. Other things work together with, with other aid programs. Um, and sorting through all of that and understanding that you're maximizing the benefit uh, is really challenging. And this, this is also something that we're, we're helping a lot of organizations with. Uh, we don't want you to miss out on the possibility that there might be other aid programs out there that would be beneficial to your operation. Please keep your mind open and your eyes open for some of these other things, um, whether you did a PPP loan or not. That's kind of the headline grabbing thing from the CARES Act. But there's a lot of other pieces in there uh, that might be worthwhile to pursue and, and probably are. If we go to number five, fundraising. Fundraising is, presents challenges and opportunities. Um, some organizations are experiencing significantly improved fundraising, if you will, or, or very positive fundraising results to the extent they've related their activities to COVID-19 relief. Uh, the, Sort of the biggest example of this is food insecurity. When you see on the news that people are lined up for miles trying to get food from food banks, um, a lot of other people who have the wherewithal to do so are donating to food banks and they're receiving um, almost, in some cases, almost overwhelming support, uh, which is good. Um, for your organization, uh, if you can relate your activities to COVID-19 relief, that might be beneficial. I'm not a fundraising professional, so somebody smarter than me can talk to you about specifically how to do that. Um, one of the other elements we're seeing is events obviously are being canceled um, uh, out of hand here um, over the next few months. But people are getting really creative in how they're doing these. We I was invited to one today that's actually going to be broadcast on, on broadcast television instead of being a live event. Uh, many of them are going online, so there's some creative um, ways that people are trying to make up for the fact that their live events where people would congregate have been canceled. Um, keep that in mind. Donors are uncertain about what to do here. If you can reassure them that what that they are um, okay to donate to you um, and it's part of the COVID-19 relief effort, um, typically you're going to have some success. If we go to number four, your 20, the budget that you approved back in the fourth quarter of 2019 for 2020 is probably not very relevant to what's actually going on at this point. Um, if you have not already done so, it is important from a control standpoint, from a governance standpoint, to recast your budget or at least rethink your budget in the context of what's going on. Because if you stay with the budget that you approved back in the fourth quarter of 2019 and you just have these uh, very sizable budget variances every month, the budget becomes less meaningful to you or, or to how you organize your, your, your uh, operation. So we're certainly encouraging everyone to recast their budget or reforecast what your 2020 is gonna look like. Um, and some people have said, well, how can I do that? I don't even know, there's so much uncertainty. There's no way I can budget for anything. We're, we're seeing organizations execute a best worst case scenario and then just coming up with something closer to the middle as a useful tool to think about how 2020 is going to progress. Um, so we certainly um, talk through that with, with organizations and we recommend that you talk through it internally if you haven't already. Um, and, and even if you identify some things that you don't know because of the uncertainty, um, just identify what those are so that you can still have a conversation and say, well, if this one variable goes a different way than we think, we still can think about the rest of the operation and what the impact might be there. If we go to number three, Speaking of budgets and stress, the New York State budget is incredibly stressed right now. Um, at the end of April, our governor indicated that they have a $30 billion budget gap to close and they were appealing to the federal government for aid. Then when we got to the middle of May, he was saying that the budget gap is closer to 60 billion. Um, so what the exact number is, is not necessarily the most important thing, but the, um, the fact that many nonprofits rely on state funding streams uh, and the state budget is se severely stressed right now um, is definitely relevant to those nonprofits. We're already seeing uh, cash flow and payments from the state slowing down. They're blaming that on the fact that the April 15th tax payment deadline was moved. So the cash inflow they would have had on, in mid-April 
did not happen. Um, how they catch up on that stuff is, is uncertain. Um, and also what this means for funding, for the funding environment going forward, the budget that was passed allows a lot of discretion for the executive branch to change things going forward. Um, and therefore there's a lot of uncertainty about what is going to, um, what's going to play out as we go through the rest of the year. Um, understanding this and understanding the impact this has on your funding streams is very challenging, but we're certainly recommending for every organization to stay in touch with those people, you know, in your, in your funding agencies at the state level. Uh, and sometimes that can be at the county level because you, your contract's with the county, but the money's actually coming from the state. Uh, keeping that in mind and, and really being in touch with what's going on is very important. Number two, we talk about keeping the good stuff. So there's been an immense amount of change. You may have people working at home who three months ago, you would have said, there's no way I'm going to have those, these people working at home, but now they are. Um, and the controls and the processes around some of that um, represent a lot of change for a lot of organizations. It's possible that you're thinking when this all ends, I want to get back to the way I was doing it before, but I would suggest, and, and we would suggest that you think about that. And maybe there are parts of this change that are worthwhile to hold on to going forward. You've learned, you and your people have learned new ways to do things that might be useful uh, on a go forward basis, even when uh, we come out of this immediate period of turmoil. And then number one, and when we talked internally about this, this was by far the number one thing we recommend for organizations, is reconsidering your strategy. Um, this, this may seem difficult because I'm in a big period of turmoil. I'm trying to just survive. How can I talk about and, and allocate resources to redefining my strategy? But really what it comes down to is when you come out of this turmoil and this disruption, what do you want your organization to look like? Is it as simple as saying, I just want to get back to what I looked like before? And in many cases, that's not the best answer. Organizations were financially stressed and operationally uh, stretched before all of this happened. What this disruption has done is expose some of those things in a more uh, obvious way. And it doesn't necessarily behoove you in terms of your long-term strategy to just try to get back to the way you were before if the way you were before was uh, presented its own challenges. So understanding what you want to look like coming out of this and that it may not be exactly the same as what you were going into this uh, is really important. If you haven't talked about that kind of thing within your organization at the governance uh, and management level, you probably should. We strongly recommend that you do. And that may mean making some hard choices. Um, so keep that in mind. And, and again, we're happy to help you with that discussion. Lastly, we have our Bonadio Cares and More consulting team. I think I mentioned that we're helping a lot of organizations with these challenges. We are, uh, and we're happy to help you. And our, certainly our contact information is, is at the end of the presentation. Um, there's a lot of questions about this, a lot of uncertainty. We're happy to help um, talk through some of those things and, and manage through them. Great. Jeff, thanks so much. That was really well done, really helpful, I think, as well. Um, I'll take you through on the uh, what high probability will do on, on this side, um, but for a lot of the people on the call know who we are. For some that don't, I'll just do it quickly, kind of who we are. Uh, we're an investment management firm, and uh, we're unique in the sense that we're, we're a newer firm, but we're, uh, we're, we're made up of very, very experienced team. Uh, Mike Jones, who you'll hear from later, over 40 years in the industry. Jeff Coons, over you know, 35 years in the industry. Uh, I feel like the babe in the woods at only 25 years uh, uh, experience so far. So I, I'm really excited about what we have, but we try to be very focused innovatively and just focus on evidence-based strategies only. That's our mission to do, just focus on academically proven strategies and just trying to give our clients the highest probability of success. That's where the, the name came from. So just to give people a background on us, what we're gonna do is given the COVID outbreak, the social distancing, all those things, the impact that's been, We'll, we'll have uh, Jeff Coons take us through the, uh, the economy and the market, and then we'll turn it over to Mike Jones for those investment implications. So I'll you know, just quickly introduce Jeff. Uh, Jeff is a PhD in economics, has run, been run the investment side and run uh, the firm of a multi, multi-billion dollar firm. And uh, we were glad that Jeff wanted to join us and, and, and help create this high probability strategy and, and, and move us forward. So without further ado, let me turn it over to Jeff. Thanks so much, Steve, and good afternoon, everyone. As leaders, we're responsible for guiding our organizations and making decisions despite less than perfect information. 
the COVID-19 pandemic and the uh, uh, social distancing that was used um, to combat it um, has in, in many ways uh, been an extreme example of that. What I'm gonna do over the next few minutes is provide a, a framework for um, helping you make decisions in light of um, the uncertainty of the environment um, with respect to what's going on in the economy and the markets. And then I uh, will introduce Mike Jones, who will provide an investment framework for a higher probability of uh, achieving your organization's uh, goals. So let's start with the economy. Um, and uh, um, you know, our framework is going to start with the idea that you should take the information that's most important for you to make good decisions and put it into one of three buckets. What you know, what you don't know, but others do know, and then what is unknowable today. If you're anything like me, you've been spending a lot of time reading articles and uh, listening to experts to try to reduce what's in that second bucket. What I don't know that other people do know. Um, you know, the reality is uh, I've been listening to a lot of um, people talking about the economy, in particular, the recovery that's um, going to occur in the economy. Will it be a V, a W, or a Nike swoosh? And uh, what I've come to the conclusion on is a lot of what people are positioning as new information is actually just guesses about the unknowable. So what do we know? This slide here uh, um, highlights what we know. And the first thing we know is this equation, C plus I plus G plus X. C is consumer spending, I is investment spending, G is government spending. And together with net exports, they represent the total economic activity of a nation. If there's anything you remember from your Economics 101 class, this equation should be it. Um, it is what I use as a framework to help me understand the arguments that people make about the direction of the economy and be able to break down and validate um, the case that they have. C, the, the first part of this consumer spending was 70% of the US economy prior to the pandemic. And uh, what you need to know there is that consumers spend income and income requires jobs. So anybody making a case around the economic recovery and its path needs to talk about the path of jobs um, recovering in the economy. I is investment spending. Investment spending was 17% of the economy um, prior to the downturn. Um, investment spending is driven by CEO and CFO confidence. If um, executives believe that demand for their products are going to exceed their productive capacity, they're gonna to invest to, to expand that production. And that leads then to G, government spending, and it leads to the second thing that we know. We know that the federal government is aggressively pushing to stimulate the economy to uh, uh, create a recovery here. The fiscal package that we've seen so far includes um, unemployment benefits being extended and raised. It includes uh, um, loans, the PPP loans to and other loans to uh, employers, some of which will be forgiven, and it includes outright checks to consumers. The uh, monetary policy response of the Federal Reserve has included lowering interest rates, injecting liquidity directly into the uh, system, and then backing bonds, mortgage bond market, corporate bonds, um, asset-backed securities, and municipal bonds. What we know so far is that um, these efforts on the, the government's part um, are not gonna be enough to stem a recession over the near term. What we don't know is whether these um, efforts will be successful over time. And that leads to the second part of this slide, which is what can't we know today? We can't know the timing of this recovery because it's based on a path of a pandemic that is based, gonna be driven by decisions that haven't been made yet. I'm not just talking about decisions that governors make about when to open the economy. I'm also talking about when consumers and businesses believe they can return uh, without extending the pandemic. Um, likewise, we don't know the structural issues that need to be dealt with. Can debt be forgiven to allow businesses to rehire and, and start investing again? Um, we don't know what the changes are in consumer behavior. Um, you don't know whether long-term consumers are gonna be willing to go into a crowded restaurant again, or for that matter, stand in line for an open bar at a crowded fundraiser. We simply don't know these things. And please understand that this information is gonna ebb and flow. It may be two steps forward, one step back. We need to be thinking about the trends of you know, the direction of where things are going. But importantly, we shouldn't be making decisions based on a guess 
as to uh, um, things that are unknowable today. Instead, we should make decisions that are flexible today. Um, and uh, Jeff talked earlier about the idea of uh, scenarios, but decisions that are flexible, and then um, as new information comes, try to process that new information through the framework that we've just discussed. So now if we move on to the markets, the, uh, this table provides uh, a list of different stock and bond indexes. Um, and then the column uh, with the first column with the numbers shows um, the returns from the peak in the US stock market in February to its um, most recent trough in uh, uh, March 23rd of 2020. Um, and then it's also showing the numbers that are more likely what you're going to be seeing in the performance reports that you're getting um, through the end of April. There are two points I'd like to make about the markets. The first point is that um, differences among uh, performance of manage different managers, differences in performance among different portfolios will be driven much more by the basic inherent style of those managers than by any amount of skill. Um, you know, if you case in point with this, if you look at the returns of the Russell 1000 growth index, and look at that last column, you'll see negative 1.4. Large cap U.S. growth stocks are barely down year to date. But on the line above that, um, large cap value stocks are down about 18%, and small cap stocks are down about 24%. Don't be surprised if your managers that tend to buy big cap growth stocks, they'll come into the next meeting declaring victory in an abundance of skill. Um, but you should not think that um, this is a litmus test for manager skill in any way. In fact, uh, Mike Jones wrote a wonderful paper that uh, just came out called The Elephants in the Room, um, talking about some of the risks embedded in large cap growth stocks today. So don't believe that this, um, these portfolios are risk-free just simply because of how they did over this most recent time period. The second point that I want to make is that um, you know, when the pandemic was uh, unconstrained, the markets reacted to that information and their response was swift and severe. But we shouldn't think uh, or use the word unprecedented to describe what's gone on in the markets. And if we turn to the next slide, what you'll see is this is a picture of bull and bear markets going back to the 1920s. Um, it includes downturns that were just as swift and even more severe than what we've gone through over this time period. And yet this history is part of the, uh, the background for us as equity investors and, and long-term equity investors. We need to understand that environments like this, even though every bear market is unique, um, environments like this come and go. And as long-term investors, if our allocations are correct, sticking with that long-term plan is very, very important. And with that, I'm going to introduce Mike Jones. Um, you know, as Steve mentioned, Mike has got uh, over uh, 40 years of investment experience. A lot of that has been also working with non not for profits, both as an investment manager and as um, a board member. He has, um, you know, been really a, a part of the uh, leading edge of the evolution investment management. You know, starting um, as a uh, helping to found a stock picking firm back in the mid 1980s, and then a uh, and that was Clover Capital, and then helping to found a uh, index allocation firm of Alesco in the 1990s, and now today um, uh, founding a uh, um, factor based investment firm with high probability advisors. I believe you're going to find his experience um, uh, quite variable, valuable, and uh, I look forward to his comments, Mike. Thanks, Jeff. You know, we really got to stop pounding on this 40 years. It makes me feel really old. I'm going to take a nap here before we get started, if you don't mind. <clears throat> but let's go to the next slide. We'll talk a little bit about investments. And whenever we're going to talk about the stock market, we have to talk about behavioral finance concepts. A lot of stock market activity is driven by behaviors that are emotionally connected. Um, and if you ever needed a case in point, just take a look at March of this year. There's some, some uh, behavioral concepts that have been developed by, uh, by academia that, uh, that are very poignant here, one being recency, and that is that people always believe that the recent events are more important than past events of a similar nature. This is particularly too, uh, true of uh, tragic or uh, uh, troublesome events. Uh, I can recall as a great example of this back in 9-11, uh, in 
on that evening of after the uh, Twin Towers came down, I was on the phone with my mother, who was quite upset, and made the statement that this is the worst thing that's happened in my life. And I said to her, Mom, you were a teenager when Pearl Harbor happened. And without question, Pearl Harbor was a lot worse than what just happened in New York today by a lot of measures. And she said, well, you know, you might be right, but this just feels worse. And she was right. It did feel worse because we know what the outcome was of Pearl Harbor. We know what the outcome was of past tragic or terrible events. And that makes them recede in our memory in terms of the poignancy. But when things are happening in front of you and you don't know how they're going to turn out, that's when, uh, that's when recency kicks in and we begin to think that there's something happening here that is way worse than what we've gone through in the past. Um, second thing being hurting and that often when, when somebody yells fire and, and everybody starts running toward the exits, your natural instinct this is what keeps us alive in the animal kingdom. The natural instinct is to run for the exit. Um, hurting is uh, comforting because you're doing what every el everybody else is doing. Uh, unfortunately, in investments, it doesn't work very well. In fact, doing what everybody else is doing works very poorly, particularly if you're the last one uh, to the uh, turnstile. The last thing here is loss aversion. <clears throat> and uh, academics have documented that we're probably about twice as sensitive to a loss as we are to a gain of equal dollar amount. And if you needed any, any proof of that concept, uh, let me ask you, you looked at your portfolios at the end of 2019 and they were up over 30, the equities were up over 30%. And you look at your portfolios at the end of April of 2020 and your, port, your equity portfolio were down about 10%. Which one had more emotional impact on you? The down 10% or the up 30? Now, clearly, it was down more than 10%, so the bounce back is figured in there. But declines are terrifying. And, that, and the problem with that is that it can lead you to take on behaviors, behaviors that are emotionally driven that are very damaging. Let's take a look, look at the next slide. This is a slide that came from my recent paper called Unprecedented, and it just takes a quick look at what happens if you miss only a few days in the stock market over a 30-year period of time. If you look at the last approximately 30 years, the uh, compound annual return of the, of the uh, market was about 9.29%, not too bad. But if you missed the one best day in that entire period of time, 30 years, one day, you missed one day, down four tenths of a percent compound annual. That's a huge amount of money. If you um, if you miss the five best days, you miss one and a half percent compound annually of, of that market return, and so forth, so forth as we go down the line. So being out of the market at at a particular point in time when things are good can be very uh, damaging to your por portfolio's performance. The crazy thing is that the best days in the market often happen right on the heels of the worst days in the market. And if you ever needed any evidence of that, take a look at, the, at late March and, and, uh, and through April of this year, uh, on the heels of some of the worst days we experienced in, in mid-March, we had some of the best days we've ever experienced in late March and April. Hopefully you were all in the markets to experience those. Take a look at the next slide. This came from Jeff Kuhn's um, piece, a very well done piece that he did called No Time Like the Present back in, in March, when people were asking, what should I do, uh, you know, should I, uh, with uh, money on the sidelines and, and such. And Jeff uh, pulled up this, this bar chart, chart that shows uh, rolling five-year annualized returns in the market over the last 80 years, starting from 1940. And the blue bar represents all periods of time. So throughout every every period in that 80-year period of time, you can see that the out, the outcomes are spread across that. So that the worst 5% boundary down at the bottom uh, is about a nine tenths of a percent compound annual negative return over a five-year period of time. The median compound annual return is 12%, not too shabby. The orange bar represents what happens after the market's gone down 25% or more. 
What's, what does the forward five-year annualized return look like then? And here we see some very interesting uh, changes. First and foremost, the median has gone from 12% to 15.3%. You gained 3.3% compound annual extra return in your five-year rolling returns after a market decline of, of significance. And then equally important is the lower boundary the lowest 5% of this distribution goes from a negative 1% to a positive 7%. It's an, almost an 8% change in the, in the outcomes, the lowest bounded outcome that you could have during that period of time. This math is com very compelling that you have, to, you have to lean in to down, severe down markets. And uh, there's a different, couple of different ways to do that. Not everybody had cash on the sideline, but there's some things that we talk about in rebalancing. And rebalancing is driven by this notion. Next slide, please. So we come to today, what do endowments and foundations and all investors really, what do they do in this current environment? And the first concept here is stock prices reflect what is known today. Uh, and that is always true. The stock market is a great uh, integrator of known fact. There's a lot of smart people looking at the stock market every day, making judgments around individual companies, around the market as a whole, and so forth and so on. And the stock market is pretty darn smart. But it will react to things that we don't know. But trying to guess, outguess the market on things we don't know has proven to be very difficult. So, when you buy into the stock market, you understand that you are buying a living, breathing entity. Businesses that can change, that can adapt to con conditions, uh, and, that, and that have um, shown the ability to grow their net value, their earnings, and deliver improvements in, in uh, wealth to their investors. So when you buy in, don't try to beat the market as much as you try to be in the market. The second thing here is very uh, timely, and that is there is no all clear signal. There never is an all clear signal. In the financial crisis of 2008, 2009, there was bad news throughout 2009 and 2010. And in both of those years, the stock market was up double digits. As a matter of fact, almost 30% in 2009 and over 10% over in 2010. So the all clear signal from the financial crisis really didn't come until probably 2012, well beyond when stocks had already regained their footing. This is true of every crisis I've seen. And I've seen a few, I, that 40 year thing is true, sadly, but uh, every time that the market and the economy and the world has a tragic situation, the stock market anticipates what's going to happen well in advance of it happening. So if you feel like you know, unemployment is very high and I got to wait for it to come down before you buy in, you will miss things. As a matter of fact, there's a statistic that I, one of my favorite statistics about the stock market is stock market returns during periods of time when unemployment is above 8% and during periods of time when unemployment is below 5%. And uh, I can't quote this right now. I, just, I wrote it in prior papers that whose intellectual property belongs to another firm now. Uh, but Suffice it to say that the stock market returns when unemployment is above 8% is far higher than stock market returns when, when unemployment is below 5%. That's just another um, way to think about the fact that you're not going to, when the all clear signal comes and unemployment rolls down below 5% and things look good, it's too late. So the last Last thing I'll come to is that staying the course, having a solid investment plan, uh, uh, you know, reviewing that plan from time to time, but having an asset allocation that makes sense, a risk program that makes sense, uh, a, uh, an investment program that makes sense to you, you need to stay the course. You can't react to uh, emotionally driven uh, headlines. You can't react to things that, that uh, make us all feel un uncomfortable and uneasy. And you, you need to stay the course in your investment program, but staying the course doesn't mean doing nothing. So let me turn it back now and, uh, to Steve and talk about some things that you actually can do. Great. Thanks, Mike. Really appreciate it. 
Um, Jeff uh, Paley had a top 10, and uh, uh, we're not as smart, so we can only come up with a top five list. But it is good to have, you know, five things that, you know, actionable things that you can consider. And Mike Jones mentioned, number one, rebalancing back to those long-term target allocations. That is so key, and Mike had alluded to that. And for us, we went through that with all our clients in March. When all this dislocation happened, we rebalanced every account, which is a scary thing to do, but it's been nice because as we've seen the balance in April and so far in May, our clients are benefiting from that. And that's something we really want you to take a look at. Uh, number two, you know, use a more favorable risk return, uh, risk reward trade-off. Uh, you know, if you have cash on the sidelines or if you had new cash coming in, which is a good problem to have, there's, you know, the risk risk rewards have changed a little bit. You might want you want to think about those. And that third thing is take advantage of those government subsidies and stimulus for, uh, support. We see a lot of that, and that's right. We'd really defer you to, you know, Jeff Pally and his group, and and that Bonadio Cares and more uh, uh, group because they can help lead you through that. But we really think getting that expertise to help you you, you through that because there's so many things, like we said, that's been coming at everybody fast and furious and. And there's new guidance on it constantly, as Jeff was mentioning. So that's a big, a big thing to take a look at. Number four, and this kind of dovetails too with uh, Jeff Paley's uh, number one, review your objectives, your time horizons, and your, your cash reserve needs. I mean, all that has changed. Like we said, the, the, your budget, all those things have, have changed. And one of the things Jeff Coons and, and, and uh, his group is doing for a lot of clients that we have now and, and for some people we're talking to is doing a really intensive cash flow study and for them. And also that IPS review, that's that investment policy statement review. A lot of those were made, you know, 10 years ago and, um, you know, and, and people haven't looked at them. Well, you need to look at that. And not only has that analysis been helpful to the clients we've done it for, uh, there's another part, the documentation has been very helpful. So all that with uh, the, the fiduciary side, that compliance side, it's nice to have a document that said, hey, I've had a third party look at that. So for all you people, everybody on boards or the management team running the not-for-profits, that's a great thing to have. So hopefully the analysis is helpful. Hopefully the documentation is helpful. Another one that, did, that came up in our discussions was, as it, you know, make sure you assess the allocations to those less liquid assets. There's a lot of hidden risk. And it's not just the hedge funds or the private equity funds that might be locked up for you know, several quarters or a year where you can't get in and out of those, but you know that going in. What we've seen is there's some sneaky ones and we've had some clients that moved over to us. Um, and an example would be a group that the previous manager uses a lot of closed end bond funds. And even in the best of times, those don't trade a, a, you know, a ton. So there's, there's kind of thin liquidity in that. In, in times of dislocation, there was a real problem. So if people needed the liquidity of those assets. They were going to have, they were going to take a major discount. So you just got to be careful and be mindful. So hopefully when you're looking at your portfolios, you're being very mindful about those less liquid assets. So those are some of the bigger things we wanted you to consider. And, and again, as Jeff mentioned, if there's anything we can do uh, from the HPA side to help, we, we'd, we'd love to do that. And our contact information is part of it as well. Uh, but we purposely reserved a fair amount of time uh, for questions. So I'm going to see if the, what questions are coming in. Um, I, maybe we're not seeing, but I'm seeing some actually. I've got some that uh, got emailed to me. Uh, one said rebalancing, how often should it be done and is it too late uh, for it now? Because there's been some movement. Uh, maybe Mike Jones, if you want to take that. Sure. Um, you should have, a, every investment manager should have a rebalancing policy that should be clear to you, to your investment committee. Uh, our policy is to, to uh, do an annual rebalance. Most, there's been studies done on rebalancing that uh, trying to figure out which, which is the most optimal. And, and the reality is there's nothing that stands out as being more optimal than the others. Uh, the trade-off for too frequent rebalancing is that the transaction costs to rebalance are too high. Uh, so uh, annual rebalancing under normal circumstances is fine, but with the caveat that you have a rebalancing uh, after significant events in the markets, and that can be both up and down. So, when you have, for us, when we got into March and after the market goes down over 20%, we automatically schedule for a rebalancing. And uh, this is when the stock market is down over 20%, we rebalance. When the stock market would go up more than 20%, we are motivated to rebalance. The, the basis for that decision is looking at historical context of what happens after those kinds of returns historically. And it just pays pretty well for you to rebalance on a historical basis when you see a significant move. 
So the answer to the to rebalancing is twofold. Have a policy, and it can be quarterly, it can be semi-annual, it can be annual, but have a uh, flexible piece of the policy that rebalances in the face of significant uh, market movements. Um, I will say that for not-for-profits, many of the ones that I'm involved with and, and uh, that we've worked for in the past, they take uh, they often take quarterly draws from their endowment portfolio to sub to, to uh, pay for the operations or a portion of the operations or to pay out to their to the beneficiaries uh, for foundations. Uh, quarterly draws are a great time to rebalance because you wouldn't want to take a quarterly draw for in a in a uh, based on the asset allocation and then have to rebalance a few weeks later. That would that would introduce transaction costs that would hurt your results. So use the use the quarterly or even if it's monthly, but I wouldn't I wouldn't monthly rebalance as much as I would quarterly. Use the quarterly cash draws and your portfolio to rebalance. If you can't get all the way back to rebalance with your quarterly quarterly cash flows, then probably have an annual supplement and and then uh, that flexible piece as well. Long winded, but I know it's an, an important issue. The rebalance was such an important thing to get done in March. It's not too late to do it now. I've had other people ask me that. Uh, the market still is down over 10%. If you, if you look at the broad market um, on the year, uh, if you did not rebalance, if your portfolio did not get rebalanced in March, uh, it's not too late to consider a rebalance right now. Great, okay. Um, I've got two other ones. I, please, if people uh, use the, the chat room and the, and the questions to the panelists, if, if, uh, if, you, want, if you have any questions. Two other ones that one is, was actually emailed to me was given how awful the economic news is, how is the S&P 500 only down about 10% 10, 10 so far this year? So I don't know, um, Jeff Coons or Mike or anybody want to take that one? Yes, so when I start and then uh, Mike can uh, uh, weigh in. The, um, uh, the stock market and stocks in general are priced off of their long-term fundamentals and their long-term cash flows. Um, even though we've got this severe news over the near term, um, really what's most important is what is the long-term uh, fundamental um, business prospects for um, individual companies and in the case of the market for the overall economy. Um, that is essentially what's being assessed by the uh, stock market when it's processing information and reacting. So when we see headlines, um, talking about near-term unemployment and talking about near-term uh, economic drop, um, really what's important for stocks isn't necessarily just that um, initial um, impact, but the, the, the impact over time. And, and in some ways, it's, it's uh, depth times time is uh, more um, important. And you know, essentially what you're seeing is a reflection of all investors and their views as to how um, you know this is going to transpire, and ultimately businesses are going to be able to recover and grow from there. So, with that, Mike, do you want to add anything? Jeff, I think you covered it pretty well. You know, um, stock market investors probably should be at, should ask themselves: Is there permanent demand destruction here? Is there you know supply demand being uh, you know the drivers? Uh, is there permanent demand destruction? And for some industries, maybe there is. But for the economy as a whole, if demand is, is reduced in one way, it usually shows up as increased demand in some other way. So on the whole, we're not going to see, for example, if population, you know, if you go back in, to 1918 when the worldwide population declined in, by a noticeable percentage, you could have said that was demand destruction. But this this pandemic that we're in right now, as tragic as it is and, ser and serious, the percentage numbers are meaningless to ultimate uh, over overarching demand. So uh, I don't. If you don't see permanent demand destruction, then it just turns down. It turns into a question of, you know, how and when does do things resolve? And for that, we just don't have a, have an answer. But your your response was correct, Jeff, and that is that. If you believe the long-term cash flow cap cash flow generating capability of the market uh, is reasonable, then uh, you can hold in there. Great. Well, there's a couple more questions that have come in. 
One is saying, what are you using for a percentage of international equities in an average portfolio with a 70-30 risk factor? What percentage international equities? Jeff, do you want to take that? Well, sure. So, um, you know, the perspective we've taken is one of, you might describe it as global light. You know, you do look at diversification on a, a global basis, and I do know that U.S. stocks have done very well relative to international stocks over the, the past several years, but generally having exposure to economic engines outside of the U.S. is a good thing. So having some exposure, but we continue to be dollar-based investors, and as a result of that, we tend not to go as far as a true global bond index, which might be something closer to 50 or 55% U.S., 45% um, uh, non-U.S. Our, our view is more of a 75% U.S., 25% non-U.S. Um, for most portfolios to get you that diversification, but not necessarily be as impacted by uh, um, the, the effect of the dollar um, on portfolios. Mike, do you have anything to add there? No, I think that's right. I think that, uh, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, there was quite a strong push toward uh, more international exposure in the portfolios. And then of course it didn't work out that the international component has been very good uh, of late. A big part of that is, uh, is the uh, currency. The US currency has been very strong, particularly in the past five, 10 years. Uh, I think for most, for most people whose liabilities, and that would be your cash flow streams out, those liabilities are dollar denominated. Probably doesn't make it make sense to have a fully internationalized, you know, uh, all world type portfolio because the uh, currency risks that you're taking on are, are are additive to your to the underlying stock and bond risk. So uh, it's it's a uh, a question of risk management as much as anything else, as long as along with breadth and the benefit of diversification. Um, one last thing that I'll mention is that this has been a particularly bad period the last five years, a uh, particularly bad period for international stocks versus U.S. A lot of that has been driven by those elephants in the room. That last paper that I, recent paper that I wrote about the impact of the, of the six uh, so-called fan mag stocks, uh, they have a disproportionate impact on the indexes. And if you take those out of the equation, you'll see that international stocks haven't really been that much worse than U.S. stocks, but uh, optically it looks a lot worse. So bottom line is, prop, I, I would not recommend that most people use a fully internationalized, uh, like actually all world index for their equities. Uh, you see a lot of investment managers that are comparing themselves to that because it's pretty easy to look good against equity. It's 50% U.S. and 50% international. Uh, it's a, that is a little bit of a sleight of hand that some investment managers like to use. But um, you should pick some level of international uh, exposure just to get the diversification because there are periods of time, like going back to the first five years of this century, uh, five, 2001 through 2006, when international stocks did well better than U.S. stocks. So there are periods of time when that diversification will help. Pick a number that you're comfortable with on a risk management side and, and go with it. We usually, as Jeff mentioned, somewhere in the 25, maybe even as much as 30% international exposure seems seems reasonable, uh, but it could be less or more depending on your situation. Okay, great. There's a follow-up question from this uh, attendee too. Um, you have endowments with, uh, with not-for-profits. They reduced their withdrawal rates over the last year. And what is, is, is being used currently for the average not-for-profit other than college and universities? The average withdrawal rate. Jeff, would you have, a, Jeff Paley? Yeah, I can take that one. The, the, what, if we look at over the last year, no, there really was no changes. Um, what we've seen really is in the last 60 days, a lot of organizations have revisited their plans as they go forward in 2020 under the, under the uh, presumption that they wanna preserve the spending power long-term for a portfolio that may be artificially down, I shouldn't say artificially, it's down in the short term and they wanna preserve the long-term spending power. So there are organizations who for, who elected to forego their draw at the end of March. Um, but generally speaking, most organizations are leaning on the fact that their investment policy is sound. They are 
um, understanding that that means they're going to take draws in good times and in bad times. But over the long term, that should all even out if they stick with the plan and, and do some of the rebalancing and things that um, you know we've talked about during this last last hour or so. Uh, so we have not seen across the board changes. A few uh, organizations have reduced their draws in the in the immediate past couple of months, but for the most part, no, we've not seen changes. Great. And there's one more question, probably for you, Jeff Bailey. When you when you said 100% of the people you're working with on the PPP forgiveness, uh, you found things. Are there certain common ones you're finding that were, were kind of low hanging fruit for people? Um, I guess there probably are. A lot of it relates to the payroll. There's opportunities, if you will, to pay things like hazard pay or bonuses that are associated with the disruption of COVID-19. In, in effect. Um, rewarding or incentivize, re incentivizing your people to stay with you and or rewarding them for getting through this stressful situation with you. Um, there's, so there's some of those things, but there's a lot of elements, a lot of moving parts to this. And um, on the compensation side, there are a lot of things that people are doing, tactics that are completely legit, um, but um, may not occur to you as you're going through your normal uh, stress of trying to just keep your organization going and, and alive. So it's a, it's a kind of thing where we have individual conversations and those ideas just kind of percolate to the top. Great, okay, thank you. I think that's all the questions we've seen. So I just wanna let people know, as we said, we, we've recorded this, we'll send out the recording, we'll give you the slides as well, uh, our contact information, and there's been some articles that have been referenced and we'll include those well, as well, so you have a nice big uh, package to go along with that. Hopefully this has been really helpful. We I know everybody here has enjoyed uh, being part of it. Uh, Tom, any final thoughts or? No, great job, guys. I learned a lot myself. Yeah. <laughs> great. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. We really appreciate it. Thanks for your time uh, today. Thank you. Thank you.